Right. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm first of all going to give you a bit of background to variation in aging rates, which leads to variation in lifespan. And I'll tell you first a bit about that uh, in general. And then I'm going to tell you how remarkable birds are. And then I'm going to talk to you a bit uh, about work that I do. Uh, although I, I work on many aspects uh, related to aging. I'm going to tell you a bit about stress and telomere loss. And don't worry, I'm sure you know what stress is, uh, but you might not know what telomere loss is. Now, when we think about what shapes how animals live their life, all organisms have finite resources that are available to them from their environment. And evolution has shaped different species to use those resources in different ways so that they get the highest reproductive success. So they can use the resources for growth, they can use the resources for reproduction, and they can use the resources for self-maintenance. Different organisms partition their resources in different ways. And what that means is we see a huge variety uh, in the biodiversity of animal life history. Some animals put a lot of resources into growth, some stay small and put more resources into reproduction. Some just do one big bang reproduction. Others take it slowly and they reproduce maybe every year, maybe not even every year. And then some organisms put a lot of resource into self maintenance. And it's the amount of resource that goes into self maintenance that is important uh, when we think about aging. So most organisms have maximum lifespans, and that's due to variation in the rate in which bodies deteriorate. Uh, we all deteriorate, some of us faster than others, unfortunately. We don't all do self-portraits of ourselves as we age. So what you can see here are Rembrandt's self-portraits when he was young and then got older and then a bit older and older again. And you can see uh, that he charted the changes uh, in himself. Different species age at different rates. And that's a really interesting area uh, of biology. Now, why does aging take place? It takes place because uh, you get an accumulation of damage with time, damage to the DNA that we all rely on to make our bodies work. Our DNA is being transcribed all the time in order to, to give us the physiology the cell turnover, the cognitive power that we need. And DNA gets damaged with time. Uh, and the rate at which that damage occurs determines how quickly we age. So damage to our cells and our DNA increases with age and, it, and causes some malfunction. Now, the other thing that also causes us damage is that we use oxygen to generate energy. And producing energy from oxygen, a byproduct is the generation of chemicals that cause oxidative damage, okay? What are called free radicals. Uh, you're probably always being told that certain vitamins will help uh, because they are antioxidants. In other words, uh, they might slow down the oxidative damage that our bodies are generating all the time. What's really happening is we're rusting. Um, so in the same way that your car gets oxidized or many other things, uh, your body to an extent 
Uh, you might say I'm a bit rusty, but literally, you probably are. Now, of course, organisms evolve ways of trying to combat that damage. They have antioxidant defenses. Many of the, the what, as I said a moment ago, many of the, the, the vitamins that we rely on are antioxidants. Uh, you, you know, you, you're always being sold creams that you can put on your face that are full of vitamin E. Uh, that is an antioxidant. There are lots and lots of these antioxidants, different animals uh, and other organisms use them in different ways. So there are antioxidant processes to combat that. That takes up resources. Uh, and there are also repair mechanisms. We can repair our damaged DNA. We can repair our damaged cells. Our cells are turning over all the time. And, and as you know, some organisms, they can regenerate whole parts of their body. They can grow again. Um, we don't do that. Uh, so a lot's to do with how much of your energy evolution has shaped you to put into repair. So the damage will accumulate at different rates uh, in different organisms, and you can see that. So here's some pictures of my husband, Neil. Now, Neil's stranded uh, in France because the whole of France is on strike. So uh, he's not here for you to compare this, but this is Neil uh, when he was a young man. Uh, he's a bit older, uh, which is roughly how he looked when I met him. Then he became a bit more sort of scrubby looking. Uh, there he's, he's trying to look a bit hip, I would say, and not entirely succeeding. Uh, and here he is, uh, a recent photograph now, and you can see that he's changed quite a lot. Um, he's, he's lost, actually he's lost more of his hair than that shown in that picture. Um, and his hair is going gray. Uh, his skin looks a bit different. But one thing I just, for the men in the audience, I'd like to tell you is that the degree of baldness has no relationship with lifespan. If you go bald early or late, doesn't affect how long you're going to live. If your hair goes gray, that's also not related to lifespan. So there are changes that take place with age that are not predictive uh, of how long you're going to live. They might give some people a clue on how old you are, uh, but they might not. So we see these changes and uh, some of them we just can't repair. So some organisms live much longer than others. So here's some examples. Uh, this is a, an ocean clam, a bivalve that can, the record lifespan in this species is 592 years. Another amazing animal is the Greenland shark, 392 years. One of the most amazing organisms is a plant, the bristlecone pine. Uh, which is reckoned to live over 5,000 years. Now, when it comes to plants, I'm not going to talk about plants, uh, their biology is very different, and it starts to become difficult to say whether or not it's the same organism. There's so much change going. Here's another little animal that you find in ponds called hydra, uh, and it's thought to show almost negligible aging, but again, it's biology is very different. Another remarkable thing are what you see in some of the social insects like ants or bees, where you have a queen, as you see here, here's a queen ant. She's bigger uh, than the worker ants. Here are the, the workers around here. The queen ant can live 28 years in some species and the workers only two to three weeks. They have the same genome, and it's not simply explained by the workers working harder. Uh, their genome is being transcribed differently, and that makes uh, a big change to how quickly they age. These workers, uh, even if you give them an easy time, they, their lifespan will be short. So big differences in biology there, even with the same genetics. 
So I'm gonna run through now a few things that broadly speaking relate to animal lifespans. Okay, so body size is one. Uh, as I'm sure you know, larger animals tend to live longer. And here's a plot here. On this axis here is body mass. So small body mass, large body mass, short lifespan, long lifespan. These are logarithmic plots, and then you get a straight line. You can see that the big animals tend to have longer lifespans. That's a, a broad pattern. But you can also see uh, that there's a lot of scatter around that. But generally speaking, uh, large species have longer lives than small species. But this size-related difference in lifespan, it's not always like that. If you think of dogs, uh, now, now we're looking within a species, we breed dogs to be different sizes. Uh, so you can have a Great Dane, way up here, this is male body mass, big dog. And uh, I don't really know what that is, <laughs> but it's a little dog. Uh, it looks bigger uh, than it really is. So it's a little dog. Anybody who's owned a Jack Russell will know that Jack Russells live a long time. Anybody who's owned a Great Dane or a St. Bernard or a Pyrenean mountain dog will know that these dogs have a short lifespan, maybe seven years. Your Jack Russell might last 20 years. So within species like this, we don't see that same pattern. We see that the bigger ones have shorter lives. They're aging faster. So growth rate matters then in, in this case, because what these big dogs do is they grow fast. Most evolved large animals grow slowly. When we tinker with the biology of these dogs, we get them big by making them grow fast. And faster growth is linked to shorter lifespan. Okay, so that's why we see that kind of pattern in the dogs. They're growing too fast. Another thing that influences animal lifespan is body temperature. Animals that are cold-blooded, which are, is the majority of animals, tend to live much longer uh, than warm-blooded animals. The war, there are only two broad taxa that are warm-blooded. The mammals, that's the hairy ones, animals with hair, or in some cases less hair as they get older, um, are the warm-blooded mammals. And then we have the birds, and they're also warm-blooded. Cold-blooded animals of the same size as a warm-blooded animal usually live much longer. So here's a giant tortoise. And they live certainly upwards of, or can live upwards of 150 years. Uh, this is an Aldabra tortoise. Uh, I think there's one called Jonathan that's reckoned to be 192. You can, can't always be sure, of course. Uh, Jonathan can't really tell us. But this giant tortoise, its body mass is similar to that of a lion. And the maximum lifespan of a lion is about 25 years. So body temperature then also has an impact on lifespan, broadly speaking. The other thing, of course, is the rate of living, uh, the metabolic rate, how fast animals uh, are using up energy, how quickly their bodies are go are sort of how fast you're living, if you like. Um, higher here again is one of these plots. We've got metabolic rate, resting metabolic rate on this axis. Again, it's a logged axis, log lifespan. You can see that the low metabolic rate, this is just for the mammals, those with low metabolic rates have longer lifespans. Uh, sorry, those with low metabolic rates have longer lifespans, short uh, metabolic rates. Fat, sorry, I'm getting muddled here. Fast metabolic, high metabolic rate, short lifespan, right? So the rate of living is related to lifespan. High metabolism, short life, low metabolism, 
long life. So I told you four things then that broadly speaking uh, are associated with aging slowly. That's small size, uh, sorry, it's body size uh, and, and small size gives you longer life, fast growth shortens life, having a, a warm body seems to shorten life and, and having a high metabolic rate uh, also seems to be associated with a shorter life. Now, what about the birds then? Where do they come in? I said uh, a small body is associated then, tends to be associated with a shorter life. Do birds have small bodies? Yes. Birds have to fly and they keep their bodies small. Evolution has shaped them that way. Do birds grow fast? Yes, birds grow really fast. They tend to be seasonal breeders, as you know. They're growing while they're in the nest. And most birds are fully grown by the time they leave the nest. They do very little growth after that. Because they've got to fly and they've got to get ready for flight. And so they get most of their growth done uh, while they're still in their nest. So they're growing fast. Do they have a warm body? Even for an endotherm? they have a warm body, even for a warm-blooded animal. Our, tem our body temperature is around about 37, 38 maybe. If it goes above 40, we are in real trouble. The birds, normal, most birds, their normal running temperature is 42 degrees. So their, their bodies are warm. And their metabolic rates are also very high. So, Here's two animals then, a great tit, a bird, and a wood mouse, uh, a mammal, both warm-blooded, uh, both around about the same body mass. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to what the maximum lifespan of a great tit? You probably see it in your garden. Talking maximal lifespan here, not uh, average lifespan, but maximal. Three years. A wood mouse. Anybody know wood mice? <laughs> okay. The the sort of rough lifespan of a maximal lifespan of a great tit if it doesn't get eaten uh, or die of starvation or something else is about 14 years. Now it's a very small bird. But a wood mouse also, if it's protected, its maximum lifespan is about 20 months. Here's two more that are about the same size, uh, a nida duck and a rabbit. The lifespan of a, a nida duck, 36 years, this is in the wild, some occasionally a little bit longer than that, but that's roughly 36 is about their maximal lifespan. We know a lot about birds and their lifespan in the wild because you can put rings on birds. There's a whole army of keen bird ringers who ring uh, birds. In the early days, they were the rings were made of aluminium and we thought birds lived not as long as they do. Once stainless steel, bird rings came in with individual identification on them, it became clear that birds lived a lot longer than we thought they did. So I did that then, about 36 years. A rabbit, uh, its maximum lifespan is around about nine years. And that's, that's pushing it for a rabbit. So contrary to what I told you then about the life history traits of birds, their warm bodies, their small size, their fast growth, their fast metabolism, all of which would lead us to expect a short life. Birds have long lives. Just to show you that in another way, here's a picture of a biologist who used to work at Aberdeen University, a man called George Dunnett, who did some wonderful work uh, with this bird species here, the fulmar, one of our seabirds in Scotland, Bridgeton Cliffs. George 
worked in Orkney, and, and when he was a young man, he caught this homer, and he put a, a ring on its leg, a stainless steel ring, luckily. And he came back 30 years later, and he caught the same bird again. And he knew it was the same bird, because it still had its ring on. And that bird was still at its nest site, still breeding, had a, had an egg uh, in its nest, and it didn't look any different to George. Uh, now, as you can see, George looked a bit different. And I don't think he was, can't be sure. I'm not sure if he was reproductively active uh, at that time. Um, but anyway, we know for sure that the Fulma was. So on average, birds live three times as long as a mammal of the same body size. That's on average. Some much longer. There are some groups of birds that are exceptionally long-lived. The seabirds tend to live for a very long time. They reproduce very slowly. They, although they grow fast, they delay their maturation. That full, those fulmars I showed you, they, they don't start breeding until they're nine, about nine years old. Um, parrots. If anybody's kept a parrot, have you got a parrot when you're a child? It's likely it might still be with you. Parrots are really long lived. They can live 80, 90 years. Um, don't get any now or you <laughs> could be in trouble. Um, sorry, that, that was a bit insulting. <laughs> um, this is one of our, uh, uh, a very small seabird, that storm petrel, leeches storm petrel, that only weighs 35 grams. These birds are living in a hostile environment, the marine environment. Uh, Leachy storm petrel can reach 38 years or more. I don't know if that's me making that noise or... So why do birds have such a long life? Why do they age so slowly? Well, one of the reasons is that flying is a very demanding lifestyle. Um, you have to keep a low body mass uh, in order to get off the ground. You have to keep the body in very good condition in order to fly. You can't fly with a Zimmer frame, let's say. So, and the takeoff especially is very expensive. Uh, some birds, you know, can glide. They don't always have to use flapping flight. But evolution has favored then, going back to what I showed you at the beginning, animals have to allocate their resources. Uh, birds allocate a lot of resources to maintaining their body, because if they don't, they won't be able to fly. So high priority uh, for flight. Also, because they can fly, they've escaped uh, many of the causes of death. They can avo avoid a lot of predators. They can migrate away from an area when conditions get rough. Uh, they can, of course, migrate very long distances. Think of the Arctic tern, a very small bird, and it will fly from the Arctic to the Antarctic in winter and back again in the summer. The distance it covers is phenomenal. I used to work with Arctic terns. Uh, they can live uh, 25 years more, uh, long lived, but energetically, uh, they do a lot. So here's a plot here. There's quite, quite a lot on it, but what I just want to show you in this plot. So again, these are these log plots. This is lifespan on this axis and body mass. The blue dots are birds uh, and, and some flying mammals. There are some mammals that say fly, but you know, you get fleece flying squirrels uh, and so on. And you also get bats. Um, and then you have the non-flying 
mammals and the non-flying birds. You know, there are birds like emus and so on. Um, but what I want you to see is that the relationship between body mass and lifespan is different if you're a flying animal. Flying animals, whether they be birds or mammals, have long lives. Bats are another group that are small and live long. Uh, so the lifespans uh, of flying animals tend to be long for the kind of reasons uh, that I've just been telling you. So flight then, you've got to be in good condition. It's energetically demanding. Another thing that birds do is, I said that when we're producing energy from oxygen, birds produce less of these damaging free radicals when generating energy. For a unit of production of energy, the bird is generating less damaging uh, free radicals than a mammal is. So they, they're doing thing, they're doing the same thing. Uh, they're producing ox, uh, energy from oxygen, but they're doing it in a, a slightly different way that's less damaging, even though they need a lot of energy. Another thing about birds is that their body cells, people have cultured body cells from birds and mammals and subjected the cells to different kinds of toxins, different kinds of stressors, and the bird's body cells are more resistant, even in cell culture, they're more stress resistant. So they've evolved mechanisms uh, to help them keep their body in good shape. Also, because bird bodies are small, they're not doing as much cell division uh, as we are, and I'll come back to to why that's uh, important. So the birds have evolved some tricks uh, that help them uh, to live longer and age more slowly. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, you fly between the Arctic and the Antarctic, or even that you start learning to fly, because these are evolved responses. Uh, it's too late for us. <laughs> The, the animals that evolve those kind of things are the birds. But there are probably things we can learn from the birds about how to manage uh, damage. So I'm now going to tell you a little bit uh, about some of uh, the kind of research uh, that I've been doing recently. And before I do that, I just want to say that when you do research, I'm, I'm talking about research done in my group. It's always a team effort. There are a large number of people involved. Uh, uh, some of them might be students, PhD students, uh, postdoctoral researchers, colleagues. Sometimes they're working in hard, harsh conditions, sometimes in, sometimes in difficult locations. Um, and, and together, uh, we've done a lot of interesting things. And I'm only going to tell you uh, a very few of those because uh, I don't have time uh, to tell you a lot. Now, within my group, we've worked on lots of different kinds of birds. We've done work on many seabirds, uh, the guillemots here, the different kinds of gulls, lesser black black gull, herring gull, kitty wake, terns here. We've also worked with storm petrels, black guillemots, starlings, a little bit of work with uh, lab work, with uh, not with albatrosses, but not the albatross itself, with, with blood samples from them, with giant petrels and so on, with starlings, shags. But two species in particular, I'm going to show you some information from. One is this bird, uh, which uh, I've been involved uh, in a long-term study of this species on the island of Isla. Uh, it's the red-billed chuff. It's a member of the crow family. Very smart birds, as you know. Uh, Blackbird, it has red bill, red legs. This is the red-billed chuff. You might have seen it 
on Isla. We only have it on Isla and Colonsy, and there's another side to the work that we do there that's related to the conservation uh, of the species. There's also the alpine chaff, which you might see uh, when you're on holiday in the continent, very similar, uh, but it has yellow legs uh, and a yellow bill. I'm going to show you some data on a little bit of information on chuffs. Uh, and then on this bird, the zebra finch, uh, which we work with in captivity. Um, the zebra finch is in captivity, we are not. Uh, um, the zebra finch is a common little pet bird. You can buy it in pet shops, very easy uh, to keep and breed in captivity. Um, and uh, and that's why we use it. So this is some chuffs at a nest site on Isla. They breed uh, in buildings as well as on cliffs. We've been studying these birds since 1981, and we have a lot of data on aspects relating to their aging. And birds do age in the wild. So I'm, I'm just going to show you a couple of graphs here. This is different age classes of chuffs here, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, up to uh, over 13 years old. And this is their mortality rate, their probability of survival. Um, it gets, the probability of survival goes up on average, uh, as is the case with many animals. They're more at risk when they're young, don't quite know what they're doing, they're more susceptible to predators and so on. And then as they start to show signs of aging, they're again more susceptible to predators and other aspects of their body function starts to fail. So we see that kind of bell-shaped curve in the chuff and the, the sort of maximum lifespan of the chuff is about 15 years. So we see that survive, this survival change with age. This is... Uh, their breeding performance, this is their clutch size, and, and it's corrected here, don't worry about the actual figures, it's corrected for year effects, because sometimes it's a good year, sometimes it's a bad year. This is their sort of standardized clutch size, and this is their age uh, of the female. You can see when females are young, they have a small clutch size, and when they're old, they have a uh, small clutch size again. Now, some of that change is not due to aging because some birds have died, right? And it turns out, say, that in these chuffs, we know that some of the birds who are laying small clutch sizes when they're old, always laid small clutch sizes and they just live longer, right? So they are putting less effort into reproduction and they live longer. Um, so we can't, you can't just look at these graphs and infer aging, but in this species, we've also followed individuals, uh, and we know that individual performance declines with age. So from these kind of long-term studies in the field, we can show uh, that aging does take place in the natural environment in birds. People used to say it didn't. Uh, that birds didn't long, live long enough to age. Uh, but some of that was because their rings had fallen off, as I said earlier. Um, so another thing, just as an aside, uh, I don't have time to talk about it. One of the things uh, about birds is they continue reproducing, the females will continue reproducing for all of their life. And that's a typical pattern in most animals. Our own species is different. As you know, women are unable to reproduce when they're a little, only a little more than halfway through, well, certainly uh, just about 60% through their lives. They've still got a lot of their adult life to come and yet uh, they stop reproducing. So that is something, uh, is also of great biological interest, but I'm not gonna talk any more about it. Um, what we've been, uh, one of our focuses in particular is on uh, responses to stress, how that influences aging rate. We're looking at any energy generation, uh, again, on how that uh, relates to aging. 
Right, so I'm going to tell you just about two things. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the effects of early life stress exposure on lifespan. And then I'm going to come back to something I mentioned earlier, which was this telomere loss. Now, we work with these zebra finches in captivity. Uh, we're able to follow individuals throughout their lives. And they change. Uh, this is a chick. It's a bit scruffy looking, it's still in the nest, it's, but it's al almost finished growing. This is an adolescent, these are males. Uh, it acquires its nice plumage, uh, which is going to attract females or not. Um, and then when, by the time it's an adult, it's lost all this darkness on the bill, it's got a nice stripe there. Uh, it might have, you can't see it in this one, it will have nice speckles on it and a nice broad band on its chest. And that really turns on uh, females in this species. Um, when they get old, they don't look quite so good. Uh, they start to look scruffy, uh, much, a bit rusty, just like we do. But it does mean we can follow through individuals now. In general, stress exposure is known to have long-term consequences for health and longevity. But the outcome of that stress exposure will vary uh, according to the life stage, more serious in the young animal. Uh, it varies with species, small and larger animals, and it varies with how severe the stressor is. Stress is not always bad, but severe stress or quite a lot of stress in early life is bad. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. There's a kind of optimal level uh, of stress that's good for you. Maybe that's why in private schools uh, you get it rough uh, compared to, uh, you know, well, actually, I'm going down a tunnel there. I'll, I'll come back from it. Um, let's say there's an optimal level of stress. Um, now, one of the things, uh, one of the kind of uh, studies that we did was to increase stress exposure, increase the stress hormone levels of zebra finches uh, in early life. Not, not to a great degree, just to the extent that might occur if they, if, they were seeing a predator maybe twice a day, um, then they, that's a bit stressful. So that happened only when they were nestlings, okay? Only in the first uh, two to three weeks of life. And this is what happened to their survival. So the black ones are the control group, very little stress. The red ones are the ones that got some early life stress. The treatment, the early life treatment, there's no difference throughout uh, almost the first year of life in survival. In fact, there's very little difference up until uh, they start to grow old, right? These zebra finches are beginning to grow old. And then you see that the ones who had early life stress, their average lifespan is much shorter. They're growing old faster uh, as a consequence of that early life stress. So stress in early life is not good news. One thing about these individuals who've had a more stressful early life is they're much more stress reactive and they will be like that all of their life. When they encounter stress, they're much more reactive. Now that might be helpful. It might be that in the natural environment, a signal in early life that the environment is a bit more dangerous is a good thing. Then you adjust your sort of stress responses so you react quickly. Then you won't get eaten so quickly by a predator. You won't be so laid back, but that carries costs, uh, which is accelerated aging. Another interesting thing that we found in these experiments, we, we paired the birds up, was that when you pair a bird that hasn't had stress with one that has had stress, remember a long time ago in their early life, 
you, or when I say you, the, the partner catches the stress almost like a disease. The partner's life will also be shorter in the same way that the individual that had early life stress. So that having a breeding partner, in the case of these birds, that experienced early life stress has an adverse effect on lifespan. And we've been uh, looking at that subsequently in a bit more detail. What, what take home message might you take from that? <laughs> Choose your partner carefully. Uh, maybe have a look at the in-laws and see whether you think they might have stressed your potential partner in early life, in which case, run away. Now, this brings me to telomeres, okay? And uh, this is a complex bit of biology. I'm only going to tell you a little bit about, about it. We work a lot uh, with what are called telomeres. So what are telomeres? All animals or, or all the, uh, what we call the eukaryotic animals, the non-bacteria and so on, uh, who have, uh, cells in their body with a nucleus, inside that nucleus is the DNA. And that DNA is on chromosomes. It's split up into chromosomes, unlike bacterial DNA, which is a circular loop. So we've got these linear chromosomes. There are lots of advantages to having these linear chromosomes. I don't have time to go into that, but it does mean that these chromosomes have ends, and the cell needs to know that these are true ends and not a bit of broken chromosome, right? Otherwise, the repair mechanisms might start joining chromosomes together. So you have these structures at the ends of the chromosomes that are special bits of DNA that mark the chromosome end, right? So. Um, if you think of a shoelace, right, then you have little protective things at the end of your shoelace. But when cells divide, these little specialized bits of DNA, they don't code for anything, they're just protective. They get shorter, like the ends of your shoelaces start to fray. Uh, the reason why telomeres get shorter is to do with how we replicate DNA during cell division. Uh, I won't go into that. They just, they get shorter. The more the cells divide, the shorter the telomeres get. So they get worn away each time cells divide, and then they might malfunction, which will cause this kind of uh, instability in the cell. So, what usually happens then is once that's happened, the cell will die. Uh, it's no longer, its telomeres aren't functioning and uh, there are special mechanisms that kill these cells or make them die. Uh, they don't function anymore and they're, they're out of the picture. So this shortening, the more cells have been dividing, uh, telomere shortening is what is referred to as one of the hallmarks of aging, one of the processes responsible uh, for deterioration. Telomeres that aren't functioning, there's more dysfunction with age, right? Obviously, as you've grown older, your cells, even your kind of pool of cells uh, are called the stem cells. They're beginning to get a bit worn also. And telomere dysfunction has very serious consequences, usually for health in later life, but if it happens early in life, that's also very bad. It's linked to cancer, it's linked to cardiovascular disease, it's linked to poor cognitive and immune function, it's linked to toxin resilience, it's linked to arthritis, and many of the kinds of diseases we think of as degenerative diseases, age-related. Telomere erosion is part of that. We see variation in the loss rate amongst individuals of the same species, and that's linked to lifespan. And in some animals and some tissues, 
telomere, there are enzymes which can restore telomere length. Now here's the uh, you know, changes in telomere length in the zebrafinch with age up to seven years old here. This was a group of zebra finches where we can measure telomere length from tiny blood samples. Uh, and you can see the decline. It's pretty fast in early life, not quite so steep later in life, but it is going down. And we see that in humans also. We see that in, in many, many animals, not all, uh, that telomere length declines with age and the dynamics of that uh, are very interesting. Now, it turns out that stress exposure in early life accelerates telomere loss. So that's one of the reasons that's underlying that shortening of the lifespan I showed you in the zebra finch as they get old. Interestingly, in the zebra finch, mild stress in adulthood can actually reduce telomere loss and reduce mortality risk in middle age, right? So it, what it seems to do is exposure to a little bit of stress uh, is actually beneficial at that life stage uh, in those circumstances, but only, only in middle age. It's only delaying aging. It doesn't uh, necessarily extend uh, lifespan all that much, but it's still evidence of a beneficial effect. And we see that uh, both maternal and paternal age in the, in the ze zebra finch can influence telomere length in their offspring. Older age birds, mother or father, influence offspring telomere length, not just in the zebra finch and in other species. So I'm going to leave you with one positive note, uh, for the men at least. <laughs> If I said it's generally the case in most animals studied so far that older fathers have offspring with shorter telomeres, as is the case with older mothers. Very, very interesting. In humans, that's not the case. Old fathers have offspring with longer telomeres. And it's been shown that the telomeres in the sperm of older men have longer telomeres. Uh, and that's a bit of a puzzle as to why that should be so. Um, that's not to say there aren't other, lots of other things going on, but I just thought I'd leave you uh, with that little bit of biology. So what can birds tell us then about how to age slowly? It tells us that the rules we deduce from looking generally across animals or looking at one group don't have to apply to others. Animals evolve in different ways and they evolve mechanisms to cope with the lifestyle that gives them the best reproductive success. Also, the demands of flight are associated with slow aging. A high investment in body maintenance, thus a reduced risk of dying from predation makes living longer worth it. But of course, you have to be healthy right? Uh, living longer with a good body. And that birds have evolved some clever tricks to get, uh, sorry, I put a get in there, uh, clever tricks to uncouple the links between living fast and dying young. They live fast and die old. So, also, that tells us now we know why angels live a long time. It's because they can fly. So that's me done. Thank you very much. Right, uh, question time. Um, can I start, uh, Pat? You mentioned parrots, and didn't Winston Churchill have a backhoe that? lived to be about 115 or something, called Charlie, which embarrassed everybody by making out obscene comments. <laughs> yes, well, I, I don't know. I guess he probably did. And he probably, the pirate probably picked up the obscene comments from <laughs> Churchill himself. 
Anyway, mm. questions from the audience. We've got a roving mic and speak into it like this. Hi, Pat, that's great, great talk. The, uh, one of the things you said interested me, and that, that, that was that birds seem to be subject to less oxidative stress. Now, uh, I guess they've just got the same sort of my, mitochondria that we have. So is that because they have greater protection uh, against uh, free radicals? Um, you're right, they do have the same, uh, for those of you who don't know the word mitochondrion, the mitochondria are the organelles inside cells that produce energy from oxygen, okay? Um, there are other ways of producing energy, but producing energy from oxygen is done in the mitochondria. As I said, a byproduct of that is the production of these free radicals. Um, but mitochondria can change how they perform uh, such that they produce less free radicals. That happens uh, when they're generating heat, for example. Um, and the, but it's also been shown that the bird mitochondrion, on average, for a unit of the molecule that we use for energy, produce less free radicals. That, that, that's work that's been done. So there, that means the mitochondria are less efficient, of course. Uh, so the bird has to compensate for that loss of efficiency which is probably doing by having more mitochondria. Yes. Uh, I enjoyed talking a lot, of course. Uh, one of the factors uh, which is a, is a form of stress is you, you mentioned cardiovascular disease, but at the moment there is the uh, worldwide, I guess now, outbreak of avian flu, which has had massive impact in some places, for instance, on seabirds, on, on bass rock and, and so on. And I, I'm wondering if... Uh, what you're talking about with aging, does, does this tell us anything about resilience when, when you have uh, outbreaks and, and yes. possible uh, restoration of, of populations after mass disease events? Yes, so, um, okay, the question was about avian flu and the resilience or not of birds. Um, I'm sure you know that avian flu is, as you said, devastating. Our seabird populations throughout the world, but in Scotland, we've, we're losing vast numbers. Um, there are interesting differences between species uh, in how susceptible they are to avian flu. We don't really understand how it's moving. For example, uh, you mentioned the bass rock big mortality of gannets on the bass rock. We have a gannet colony in the Firth of Clyde on Ilza Craig, and that hasn't happened. Now that's unlikely to be because the gannets on Ilza Craig are resistant. It's probably to do with how the birds are moving. And in the case of the gannet, it's thought that one factor in the transmission is young birds that are prospecting. They're, they're not old enough to breed yet. They move around different colonies, but they probably don't move right around Britain. So it may be just a matter of time for Ilza Craig. Birds, um, birds have a very good immune system and they tend to be quite resistant to many uh, diseases they carry. For example, they'll carry bacteria like Salmonella, Cryptosporidia, which we would find very difficult to deal with that doesn't make them ill. But this particular avian flu 
seems to really have a high mortality, especially in geese, seabirds, not so much yet in songbirds, but uh, there, there are big changes afoot, unfortunately. Uh, now, these kind of epidemics probably happen throughout history. You were asking also what will happen to the populations. Um, for these long-lived seabirds that take a long time to mature and breed only sometimes just once, one chick a year, it'll take a long time to recover from that kind of adult mortality, unless there's migration, which may also happen. Birds may come in, um, Young birds might breed earlier. You know, they're prospecting. Often there's no space. They take their opportunity. So they might, they might recover fast. The populations might recover faster. But, and there might be some birds who are resistant. But we have to wait and see on that one, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Pat, for an enjoyable talk. Uh, on your zebra finches and the effect of age, do zebra finches mate for life or do they just change around every season, have a new mate? And secondly, you mentioned that birds live so long because they have high maintenance because they need to fly. If you're a captive zebra finch, how much flight do you actually do? <laughs> Um, well, uh, that, uh, to answer your first question, do zebra finches mate for life? They're an Australian bird. Uh, they are non-seasonal breeders, so they'll breed all the year round, which is why they're very useful for uh, research studies, but also as, as pets. You, you need to give them a bit of green and they think it's rained and then they breed. Um, they, they sometimes form quite long pair bonds in the wild. In our captive population, they don't because we don't want to be overrun with zebra finches. <laughs> so we keep the males and females separately and they'll readily, you give them another mate and They'll, they, they'll breed quite readily. Um, and then the second part of your question was about, uh, about flight and... Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, um, and when we keep them in uh, a, a kind of large aviaries uh, so that they, get, they can fly around, but when... <laughs> When they're breeding, they, they're in smaller cages. Um, they'll fly up and down to the perches, but uh, they won't be undergoing any migratory movements around the countryside. Uh, you know, we, we have to keep them in captivity. Um, so they, they get some exercise. However, that kind of thing about how animals allocate resources, that's the way they've evolved to do it, right? Um, so that they're not sitting down at night thinking, okay, I've eaten this much seed. How much am I going to spend on my telomeres? How much on growing my plumage? There's no conscious decisions. They have these evolved allocations because that's what uh, gave you know, their ancestors the highest fitness. Not very much at all. Uh, maximum lifespan. Uh, the question was how much does lifespan differ? The, anybody online wouldn't have heard that question. How much does lifespan differ between captive and wild zebra finches? Not, not very much maximum, but in the natural environment, the average lifespan would be shorter because lots of the chicks will die just after fledging. They'll be eaten by predators. 
um, or, or they might find it hard to find food and that will bring the average lifespan down. You need a microphone. Behind you. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. It reminded me of studies um, we did some time ago looking at variation within the species, the human species, you know, the, the four year difference in life expectancy between Glasgow and Edinburgh, or the 10 year difference across the Glasgow conurbation. Yes. And like the, the, the data you, you presented, we found these, these were deep rooted and due to differences were established early in, in life. And the, the analogy that we used to try and explain it was that for at any given age, Glaswegians had more miles on the clock than people in Edinburgh. The difference between their chronological age and their physiological age. And I wonder if that analogy of miles on the clock, you know, the two cars with the same age but different mileages applies to birds. Um, within species, uh, so the question was, uh, well, partly was relate, relating to variation in lifespan, even across relatively small scales that, that we see in the city of Glasgow. And is it cause they have more miles on the clock? I assume you mean figuratively speaking, not that some parts of Glasgow people are running about more than others, because uh, of course exercise is good for you. Um, but early life stress is not. And as I said, even in the zebra finches, it makes individuals more stress reactive. Um, and so their bodies are being flooded more often with stress hormones like cortisol in the case of humans or corticosterone does the same job in birds. And that has long-term consequences. You know, uh, chronic stress is uh, changing many aspects of physiology. And if you like, if you want to say age or fasting, aging faster is in equivalent more miles on the clock, then you're running everything a bit faster. You're running down faster. Uh, as the microphone has just been passed from a vegan to an omnivore, <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, appropriately ask, what about diet and birds and how does that, are there, are there vegetarians or, <laughs> or vegans uh, and are, are there you know, more carnivorous birds and if so, does that affect? Uh, yes, diet, diet, diet is interesting. Um, the zebra finch is a seed eating bird. So again, that makes it great in captivity. We're not having to go out and catch insects or worms. Uh, in order to feed them. Um, do carnivorous birds live longer or shorter than seed-eating birds? I, I've never seen any studies specifically on that. Uh, birds of prey, don't, they're not a standout group in terms of their lifespan. Um, they're a standout group, perhaps in terms of the agility of their flight. Uh, you know, something like a sparrowhawk is an amazing uh, bird when it comes to its flight performance, but I don't think it's, you know, living a lot longer than a bird of similar size who's eating grain. And there are some birds which are only eating grass most of their lives. And they're, you know, some of the geese really long live. So I don't think there's a a straightforward difference, but I've not seen a detailed analysis of that. Could be interesting. Um, you mentioned that the the lifespan of a the partner of a bird that had been stressed in early life. Also, their life their lifespan was shorter too, which is quite surprising, actually. 
Yes. Um, did you have any theories about why that might be? Yes, we, we hadn't, to be honest, expected that effect. Um, we had expected it might be the other way around, uh, that, you know, there would be a kind of mitigation of the fact of the lifespan effect by the part. And instead, uh, it, you know, that, that didn't happen. It was, uh, and, and if you had two of those early life stress birds breeding together, you know, it was even they adversely affected each other. Um, I had a postdoc who looked much more at their behavior. And some one thing that the partner of a bird or any other uh, species can sometimes do is have this kind of buffering of responses. You know, it's kind of comforting or it can have the opposite effect, which is they both become jittery. And that's what seems the most likely explanation. You know, if it was the case that um, in the natural environment, this exaggerated response to stress is beneficial because the bird or organism has set its responses according to its assessment of how dangerous the environment is, it might be advantageous for the partner to do the same. It's just that the environment isn't dangerous. And this matching of the early and later life environment may be an important part of seeing that effect. Remember, we only expose them to stress early in life, and then it wasn't a stressful environment. And it would be interesting to do the same kind. And we've done it to a degree but to make the adult environment also a bit more stressful and see, you know, if that actually gives them some kind of benefit relative to an individual that isn't prepared for it. Pat, it's a bit of a follow-up to the gentleman who asked about carnivory meat-eating birds as opposed to grain-eating or grass-eating. In the multidisciplinary graph that you had, the very complex one, one bird was away above all the others in lifespan, and that was a condor, who mm -hmm. spends most of his life not exerting any effort, flying around looking for meat to eat, and has got no predators, really a fairly stressless life as long as humans are killing beasties below or somebody else is killing them. Is this not some evidence that in fact, living a very relaxed life, eating meat, gives you a long life? <laughs> <laughs> I, I take it that's your philosophy. Uh, um, okay, it comes back to the evolved response, right? The condor is still, it can fly. It's still got to be able to take off, but it's big enough, as you say, it doesn't have a lot of predators now. Um, but uh, yes, um, these top predators uh, are likely not to have to spend so much time evading things and, uh, Good luck to you sitting back and eating meat. It probably doesn't do your heart any good. Uh, but no, it, it, it's interesting observation. Hi, J just going on on the question of diet, is there any evidence as to what bread, particularly white sliced bread in bits, can do to ducks in a pond or similar <laughs> food that people yeah, give yeah. to animals, to birds? Yes. Um, feeding bread to ducks, is it good for them? Uh, it won't be great for them. Um, if you think of the gulls, that hang around Glasgow eating chips and 
uh, ice creams and so on. There have been studies showing that, uh, you know, these, they're not as healthy. Um, birds tend not to get really fat, which is interesting. They have uh, controls as do most animals on body mass. However, another thing about birds is they're capable of putting on an enormous amount of fat for their winter migration, right? So they'll really pile on the fat and some birds will undergo a really long migration just using that onboard fuel, if you like. Um, but hanging around Glasgow eating chips or, <laughs> or bread, not a good plan. And, uh, you know, they, their, busy, you know their health is, is, is not so good. Um, and feeding, thing, feeding animals the wrong thing is always bad. And, you know, they'll, usually they'll take it uh, and it's not good for them. But I don't see loads of dead ducks. I don't think the bread is too bad. <laughs> but a lot of places now offer special duck food to try and stop people giving them. And the gals on the rubbish tips, uh, I did a, a lot of work with them. And because they've got a fantastic immune system, they could eat a lot of this terrible stuff, but some of it would really get stuck in their throats and kill them sometimes. And then, or else they would go, I'm digressing a little bit, but they would go to Mogai Reservoir and throw up everything they thought twice about into Glasgow's water supply. Leonard has a question. Um, yes, hello. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, just to continue that earlier question, is the abnormal telomere specific to birds? You know, the great conundrum that we've heard about in other talks about, um, you know, people in Glasgow aging earlier uh, in different parts of Glasgow, is that a finding that they've got in those? And just a comment uh, for those who are asking about diet, if you read any of Tim Spector's excellent books, he analyzes which foods uh, help the so-called blue populations in the world, which are the longest living, which contributes to that. So it's, yes. I, I mean, it kills a lot of the myths. The, the, there are a lot of studies that are going on on telomere length in diverse uh, social circumstances, including in Glasgow, and you do see effects uh, in the predicted direction because early life stress uh, can shorten telomeres. Um, sometimes people ask, well, you know, I said that there are enzymes which can elongate telomeres. One reason that in many animals, uh, large-bodied or long-lived animals, that doesn't happen. Uh, these enzymes are inactive, they're not produced in the cells in our sort of, in most of the body, because if you have, if you allow a cell to carry on dividing, there's a danger it will become a cancer cell. You have to control that. So, you know, as cells divide more, they get occasional mutations because the DNA replication is faulty. They can then, if they divide lots and lots of times, accumulate enough mutations to become a tumor cell. But telomere shortening will knock out those cells before that can happen. Most of the research on telomeres is done by cancer biologists. It's only relatively recently that it's been looked at in other kinds uh, of animals. So there's, there's huge areas of interesting biology there. Diet, Tim Spector, gut microbiome, all very interesting uh, stuff. But uh, that, the, the gut microbiome and diet is not my field. Any more questions? Yes. I think this will be the last one. 
so um, thanks very much for all of the answers so far. They've been fascinating. Um, you have mentioned that shorter lifespan seems to come from, for example, stress and then being more stress aware. Is there any direct benefit for the survival of the species from the shorter lifespan? So, I mean, rather than it being a cause of other things that are a benefit. Um, if, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Are, are, are there, are you asking are there benefits to a shorter lifespan? Yes, yes, exactly. So I'm asking, does, does the shorter lifespan help the animal survive directly by being shorter in some way? Um, is there some... Well, a lot of interesting things can happen there. That um, sometimes in certain circumstances, when exposed to a stressful environment, uh, breeding starts earlier, right? So in figurative terms, it's almost as if you could say the animal knows that its time is limited and it gets on with breeding. Now, when that happens in an evolved way, uh, you're going to get um, a whole different kind of life history where reproduction will start early, much more effort will be put into early reproduction rather than later reproduction, and that's part of the evolution of animal life histories is the scheduling of reproduction. But for species within a species, where you're then looking at environmental effects, you can still sometimes see a shift towards earlier reproduction. Um, of course, other things, you know, uh, shortage of food can turn off reproduction. Um, and sometimes that means a longer life because uh, you're not devoting energy to reproduction anymore, but evolution will have nothing. You know, you're, you're out if you don't reproduce in evolutionary terms. So there has to be uh, uh, what we in biology call a Darwinian fitness benefit. You have to have successful reproduction for that kind of strategy to become part of the evolution uh, of that population. So these are, you know, things that biologists are wrestling with all the time. Um, nature's diverse solutions that it comes up with. Well, Pat, that was a most wonderful lecture. Um, you can see from the number of questions how fascinated people are. And I have this enormous pleasure of giving you the text. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>